everyone. In a previous video, I showed how I designed a monogram door hanger using Carbide Create. When I made that video, I included some curly vine embellishments as part of the design, but to keep that video a reasonable length, I didn't go into how exactly I created them. So in this video, we'll talk a little bit about the difference between raster and vector graphics, and then we'll revisit that monogram door hanger project as I show you a few different ways you can convert graphics from the web to vectors you can use for CNC cutting. While there are many ways that a computer can store a graphics file, the two most common are as raster or vector graphics. Raster graphics store information about each pixel of the image. Most of the common formats you'll find on the web, such as JPEG, PNG, bitmap, and so on, are all raster graphics. Each will implement this in a different way, but each of them stores enough information to determine what color each pixel of the image is. On the other hand, vector graphics store this information mathematically. Because of this, they're more suited for illustrations or graphics of that nature. They'll define mathematically curves, lines, and other basic shapes that combine to form your full illustration. In a CNC application, this gives actual lines, curves, and so on that the CNC cutter can follow, which is why you'll commonly find it necessary to convert graphics from raster to vector. Because Photoshop is capable of doing both vector and raster graphics, we'll use it to demonstrate this principle. I'm going to use the ellipse tool to draw a circle, and then I'm going to duplicate that to create a second. To one of the circles, I'm going to use the rasterize layer. Going back to our explanation of the two types of images, the left side is now a raster image. Photoshop is storing a grid of what color each of these pixels is. Whereas on the right circle, it's actually storing that I want a circle of a certain radius and I want it filled with a certain color. Let's look at some of the practicalities of this. If I zoom in right now, you can see that I have solid black squares with some aliased, meaning some slightly off black, even though the circle itself is meant to be black. And the same is true of the other side. What I'm going to do now is scale the image down significantly. It's currently at 800 by 400 pixels. Let's reduce this to 10% of that size. Now let's turn it back. The difference should now be extremely obvious. So why did this happen? On the right side circle, we had a perfect mathematical representation of what that shape was. When I scaled it down, it simply adjusted the radius and redrew all the pixel data relevant to it. When I scaled it back up, it simply restored the original radius and was able to redraw a perfect circle from that mathematical representation. On the left, something far different happened. When I went down to 10% of the original size, I lost the vast majority of that pixel data. That hard line between the black and white circle got a lot fuzzier as there was a lot fewer pixels to represent that transition. So when I blew that back up, it had to take that now fuzzy transition and enlarge it. The results are certainly not optimal. If you're ever doing professional printing, this is why vector graphics are nearly a must. If you want to ever blow something up or change its size, having a mathematical representation is important. While a lot of this may not be directly related to your CNC work, it's important to realize that that mathematical representation of what we're drawing is what makes CNC cutting along such shapes possible. So let's look at the process I went through when adding my vine embellishment to my CNC project. As many of us do, I started my search on Google Images. I find that there are generally two keywords you can add to your search that will dramatically improve your results. One is silhouette, the other is vector. In our case, I'm going to start my search for vine vector. A lot of these results will actually take you to websites that you can download the actual vector files. It's almost always best to use the actual vector instead of trying to recreate it. 
but oftentimes you're working with a scanned image or something of that nature that simply isn't going to be available, and we'll assume that's the case for this project. Knowing what to look for when selecting a suitable graphic is really important. Anything comprised of a single color will be best. A graphic such as this has extremely small details, and it may not show up very well on your CNC. A V-carve might get away with it, but if you look at the leaves, there are a lot of small striations on them. Those would not show up very well. In the attempt to reproduce that detail, your CNC cutter is likely to just make a mess. In addition, depending on your project, whether you're engraving this in a negative or positive manner, you may need all of your pieces to be combined. When I did my monogram door hanger, I ultimately selected this image. While it has some fine detail, most of it's clearly defined and not too complicated. It's also a single color against a solid background, which means converting it to a vector is going to be fairly easy. Having selected the image I'm going to start with, I'll simply save this to my computer, and then we'll move on to the actual conversion process. As it's the program I'm most familiar with, I'm going to start my examples using Adobe Illustrator. If you can justify the cost of Adobe Illustrator for your business, around $20 a month for the single program or $50 for the entire suite, I think it's really worth it. If you're just starting out or you're just not making enough money to justify that cost yet, there's certainly free programs and we'll cover those in a few minutes. But for my money, and because I've been using these programs for many, many years, the cost of it is easily recouped in time. On the screen in front of you, you can see that I've opened up a simple new document and I have pasted our image. At the moment, this remains the raster graphic that we took from the web and Illustrator will treat it as such. The process to convert it to a vector is particularly easy. We're simply going to go to Object, Image Trace, Make and Expand. And using the Direct Select tool, the one thing to consider is that it doesn't know the intent of the document. It doesn't know that the green section was what we wanted to keep and the white background is what we wanted to get rid of. It could have been the other way around, depending on the graphic. So the only thing to consider here is that it does create these other segments. I'll, I'll fill one so that it's clear what I'm talking about. It creates the black foreground and the white ground as separate objects. Obviously, it's not necessary to colorize these and move them away. However, if you were trying to extract the background for a particular project, the same tool would do that as well. For my purposes, I'm simply going to delete them. While what I'm left with probably doesn't look much different from what I started with, in this case, it is an actual vector graphic. I zoom in, I can see that the side is made up of individual nodes that can be now edited individually instead of the entire thing as a single graphic. You may also notice it's not perfect. Depending on the scope of your project, this little abutment may not be appropriate. Learning to do these edits is one of the reasons I suggest people not use Carbide Create and use Illustrator or Inkscape or another vector graphics program first. Once you've become proficient with it, editing out this oddity will be very trivial and it will make images a lot easier to use. When I was doing the monochrome door hanger, I didn't do any of this. For one, I wasn't actually cutting the project, but even if I had been, this small of a detail would have never shown up at the scale I was working in. And if it had, it would have probably been faster to fix it with sandpaper if I was only doing one of these. To finish this, I'm simply going to click Save As, make sure I've chosen SVG, and give it a name. The process in Inkscape is similarly very simple and straightforward. I've opened Inkscape and I've pasted our graphic from the web into a new document. I'm going to make sure the image is selected, and go to the Path Trace Bitmap menu option. You can see we actually have a few options here that we didn't have before. There are a few different algorithms that we can use to accomplish different effects. The edge detection, for example, will create an outline, whereas brightness cutoff will typically create a filled area. 
In this case, this looks very similar to what we got last time, so we're just going to hit OK. Now that that's complete, it has created a vector copy of our image in addition to our original. To finish this, I'll simply delete the original and do File, Save As, Inkscape. Finally, there are some web-based options. Here I have loaded vectorization.org. I've already selected the file I want to upload, and I've left the default of exporting as an SVG file. In a matter of seconds, it has converted that graphic. Again, having a clean input graphic really helps this process. We'll go ahead and save the resulting SVG. So finally, let's open Carbide Create and let's import our three graphics. First, we'll import our Illustrator. Then our Inkscape. And finally, the one we got from the web. It's worth noting that all three of these produced almost identical results. The Inkscape version is slightly smaller. That is something to be aware of. Sometimes the conversion from inches to millimeters will create variance in your final output. But because all of these are stored mathematically, you can scale this as much or as little as you need to and not have any loss of quality like we saw back in the Photoshop example. One of the more complicated things these programs do is try to interpret curves and interpret different shapes based only on the pixel data. Because of this, you will occasionally get slight variants. Interestingly, the first one from Inkscape has several of those flat spots where it felt a curve was a line or a line was a curve. I do see a little bit of that with the Inkscape and interestingly, very little with the one we got from the web. So all three tools may have their place and especially where Inkscape and the web are both free, you might as well have those in your toolkit even if you've purchased Adobe Illustrator. We can quickly look at what these look like be carved. Thank you for watching, and I hope this makes the idea of converting graphics for use on your CNC projects a lot less intimidating. The tools I covered are not the only ones out there, especially on the web. If one of them isn't working for you, try a few others, and if you find any good ones, let me know. If you liked the video, take a moment to hit the thumbs up button, and if you'd like to see more, consider subscribing. At the time that I'm making this, I've reached over 100 subscribers, which I find incredible. I really appreciate everyone who took the time to subscribe, and I hope you continue to find my content valuable. If you have suggestions for more videos you'd like me to make, leave me a comment. The channel's still small enough that I'm able to read each and every one of them.